But anyway, we are here to talk about um, autumn hanging baskets or containers, getting our um, uh, gardens and patio spaces looking good. And Jenny, as you were speaking, you were saying it was a miserable day. Well, I had a bit of sunshine, but since you've been speaking, it's chucking it down here. <laughs> Um, uh, so autumn has um, well and truly arrived here in Ayrshire also. Greek days, yes, but also crackers like yesterday. It was a beautiful day. I was up in uh, Perth with work yesterday. There was a nip in the morning air, but the, it was dry and the wee smiley sun was showing its face all day. So it was a lovely drive back down the road. So autumn to me um, is early sunset, it's early to bed, um, the fire lit warm cups of tea, even warmer jumpers, and in my case, even more messier hair. But anyway, um, after the biz of our summer gardening excursions, autumn is the time to quieten the pace and take stock and consider how to maintain gardening activities over the next few floor months to ensure that our clients remain engaged with the natural world by providing them with meaningful and purposeful activity, along with some much coveted, especially over the last um, year, much coveted social interaction. On the Trellis website, um, some of you might not have visited it, but if you do get the chance, go and have a wee look. On our website, we have a varied selection of activity sheets that could help you plan a programme to meet the needs of your own particular group. Many of these activities are tabletop, um, similar to what I'm doing here this afternoon, making them fairly accessible to all and of course can then be carried out indoors, especially useful when you're planning for our predictably unpredictable Scottish winter weather. So shortly I'm going to be demonstrating planting up this <laughs> particular oh. hanging basket. This that you've just had um, shoved into the screen there, is um, the summer moss basket I planted up in May time. Some of you might have been at that session. So I'm going to decant it and replant it back up with for autumn interest. I'll be using spring flowering bulbs um, and these are the bulbs that we'll be getting sent out to those that complete the survey. We have got um, the uh, crocus, sorry, um, crocus tricolor, this lovely purple one with the deep sort of like egg, egg yolk centre in the middle. Um, we have got the really frilly little um, Narcissi dwarf daffodils, Rip Van Winkle, wee frilly heads in them, and then the dainty wee blue muscari. All three bulbs are easily recognise as spring flowering bulbs. So I'm going to show how to plant them inside the basket so that they will grow up, do their bit throughout the winter time and then start to flower um, between sort of like late February for the crocus, March into April for the muscari. But I will finish them off with some, the top of the basket with some colourful um, foliage plants like this heather, it's a winter flowering erica, and I've got some other plants here, but I'll speak a wee bit more about them when we get around to planting it up. So planting up the spring flowering bulbs is a sure gardening sign that autumn is upon us. And of course, this autumn month of October marks Chelsea's first year anniversary, anniversary I should say, of live Zoom sessions. And Jenny and I, the whole team, are delighted to have attracted attendees from a diverse range of settings. And of course, outcomes and benefits from the many activities demonstrated will have varied from person to person and project to project. And I'm hoping that today's um, activity will be a success for all of you also. This session focusing on the deconstructing of my summer basket and then rebuilding the planted hanging basket will address sensorial, cognitive, physical and emotional needs for individuals, supporting in particular fine motor skills, like physical activity, which can lead to stress reduction, and the opportunity to explore creativity, choosing those plants, as Jenny talked about in her PowerPoint presentation, sit down, look at some magazines, have a flick through the in the World Wide Web for inspiration. Take a wee jaunt along to the garden centre and look at their displays that they have and choose some um, plant 
the, the tickle your fancy there. Um, so yeah, you get to um, be creative. And of course, all of these things lead to accomplishment and satisfaction. And of course, the, on care, the ongoing care of the basket throughout the coming months supports nurturing. This can be completed as a group activity, perhaps plan out who can do which particular task. And this empowers social inclusion and of course, increased enjoyment from being part of the group. And equally, setting this up as a one-to-one -one can lead to a wealth of outcomes also. But I'm sure you're all very well versed in knowing that planning is key. Depending on your group, this activity may be all set up before you gather the group together, or the setting up and preparing the session might form an integral part of the activity for some, or indeed all of the participants. Some folks actually might prepare, prefer getting everything gathered together, then sitting back going and putting the kettle on while someone else does all the, the arty farty bit of putting it together. But whatever way you decide to do, as long as you're comfortable with your level of preparation, it means that when you're actually doing the session, you're in the moment and sharing the experience with your client and not fetching about fetching phone calls or some other distraction. But I've already done my setting up, so let's get started. I'll point out some of these plans later on when I come back to talking about plans. So what do we need? Um, I'll, ha I'll lift up my scabby summer basket in a little minute. Um, but you can use prepared baskets. This is a, a, a wear basket. Some of, if some of these were in the tomato um, session, you would have seen me uh, doing the rocket. My rocket was growing in here, but it's now all finished. So I've emptied this out and this can get planted back up Oops, in there. Using a pre-filled basket can make it easier for folks to just do the planting up as opposed to having to put it about with the moss, but we'll do the moss in a little minute. We need general purpose compost. And this is just a, um, a bag of general purpose compost that I've mixed through perlite. And this is the, the perlite. You can buy perlite um, from most garden centres or online. And some of like the places like b &M quite often uh, sell it as well. And I've just mixed the perlite through um, my general purpose compost, probably about, oh, I don't know, six scoops of um, compost to one scoop of perlite. So that's six to, six to one, one to six, something like that. Um, and perlite aids aeration and drainage. When I was planting up the summer basket, I was speaking about making sure you kept the, the compost nice and moist the whole time because the basket is getting dried all the way around by wind blowing up against it and the sun is out and everything's drying out so much quicker. We're in Scotland, we're in autumn, we're going into winter and we know it's going to rain non-stop. So we don't want the bulbs in particular rotten. Bulbs like it quite dry actually. And um, so by adding perlite into the compost, you're making sure that the compost, well, you can't stop it from waterlogging, but you're doing your bit to try and prevent it from holding on to too much water, always making sure there's channels for excess water to eke out of the basket. So we've got our compost and we've got our perlite in it. Um, gather yourself a trug or something to um, put all the dead plants from the summer basket into it so that you're tidying as you go. I've got my selection of new plants sitting here that I'll talk about when I'm planting up. Um, I've got my um, hand fork here. This is my trusty Spear and Jackson one that I like using. It's a wee bit heavier though. So I've also got a plastic one that does the exact same job, but it's so much lighter. So consider the tools that you're actually using for the job and it may um, impair some more folks to have a go if the tools are more suited to their needs. Got a pair of scissors for, um, well, you'll, you'll see what I need to for in a wee minute. Okay, um, I think that's me got everything that I need to do to get started. So, I don't know, Jerry. We'll ask everybody if anybody was here for the summer hanging basket. Do you want to put a wee thumbs up in their uh, screen? And I'll know 
how much to tell people about summer baskets or if I just click right. on. Can you see? I don't know if I can see everybody. I can't see really too. Oh, well. I'm flicking along to see if anybody's putting their thumbs up now. Okay. Doesn't matter. It's okay. Right. This was a beautiful summer basket. And if nobody was there for the summer one when we did this in May, you'll just have to take my word for oh, it. Oh, so I see a couple of thumbs up now. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully you'll see that um, it's looking nowhere like what it was. But my verbena, my little croissant, my um, petunias, everything flowered beautifully. So much so I actually um, took quite a few cuttings from them in the middle of August. So I have now got lots of little baby plants growing that hopefully will do well throughout the winter time with me and I can use again to plant up next spring. So what I'm doing is I'm fighting with this wire basket here to take the, the chain off because it makes things so much more easier to work with. Maybe one a task that you would like to do beforehand. But that's me taking the chain off, but keep it somewhere safe because it's the sort of thing you put somewhere and you forget all about it. So this was a moss basket. I lined the wire basket with moss and then I planted all the plants into it. So what I want to do is the moss can be reused again. I don't want to rip everything out and put it into the compost heap because that's a waste of the moss. And moss is really hard to come by this year. I've not got to the root of the problem as to why. I did eventually manage to get some in B&Q, but I have to say, don't go to Comana because I got the last of theirs. Uh, but maybe they've got more in, but have a wee look online. Um, Crocus did have a little stock of it, but maybe where you're living, you'll be able to get your hands on moss a little bit easier than me. So I'm definitely keen to keep hold of this moss and reuse it as much as I can. So, Basically, all these plants are now dead. Um, Jenny was talking about the hardiness factor. All of these plants were tender. They're not hardy for overwintering in Scotland. So as you can see, I've neglected them for the past six weeks and we've basically just succumbed to um, our weather. We had a ground frost here the other day, so we had, so yeah, winter is definitely around the corner. So I'm just basically cutting off all of this with sharp scissors. And I'm putting it all into a trunk and that will lead to another job for me later on or a job for clients that I was working with um, by cutting these pieces of dead material up into smaller size pieces again and then they can get put into the compost heap. You can try ripping them off if you want but you'll find that they're quite difficult to do so. so Cutting them is the quickest way of getting rid of that excess foliage. Now, next week, I think I'm right in saying, Jenny, it is our composting um, live Zoom session. It is. So any beady-eyed person might spot some of this foliage um, <laughs> in my compost heap next Thursday. Um, not that I'm taking it out to my compost heap, but I'll bring a picture of my compost heap into the live Zoom session. So I'm getting things a wee bit tidier now. I can see what I'm doing. So I'm just using my fork and I'm just, maybe two people could do this. One person could hold the plant, pull it out of the way, and the second person could be wriggling the fork in. And because the compost is quite dry, and these roots aren't deep rooted like a big shrub or a tree, for example, you'll find that it comes away quite easily. And I think I've got another wee plant in there as well. So again, I'm just putting this in the tool and that will get put into my compost heap. So I'll just quickly work my way around to speed up the process of doing this. I'm doing this qu quickly, but don't you worry about being quick. It's all about empowering people to have a go. And while we're doing this, we could be talking about the roots, which plants had like the, the, the sturdier roots, which ones were a bit fragile. And even just talking about what we're going to do with all this. Is it going into the compost heap? Maybe you don't have a compost heap. You could try making a, a windowsill composter. And that's what we're talking about next week, actually. 
is a uh, windowsill composting. Um, so working our way around here, it's a great noise. I don't know if that's picking that up, Jenny. Yes, I can, can hear, you hear, that, the, I can hear the, that ripping out. The changing. And I mean, like some people might think that's quite true, but there's something quite satisfying <laughs> <laughs> to me about that. I think it's, it's just a lovely noise and just getting, some people just get so much enjoyment from just handling the compost. It's a very natural um, material and we have an innate connection with the natural world. So it's, and it's nice and dry. There's something quite comforting about it. Now, I want to scrape out as much of this old compost as possible because although I was feeding the summer bedding plants all summer long with a, a, a plant made a fertiliser, a liquid fertiliser, the compost is now absolutely exhausted and I know there's no goodness left in it whatsoever. So I'm scraping out as much as possible. Pretty good. And then we can see we've got some, this was the trailing plants that I had coming out the sides. I'm just pulling them out, the, the leafy bits at the side here, because the roots were on the inside, remember? And that just tidies all that up. Oops, I pulled a bit of moss out there. It doesn't matter, but more moss, I'm going to show you how to, to patch up. And I think we're pretty much Good to go at that. I'll tidy up my mess a little bit. Right, okay. So we've now got pretty much an empty basket fairly intact with um, moss, but I did make a bit of a hole here. So I do have some more moss and moss, um, when you're buying it from, if you've got a very mossy lawn, you can go and scarify your lawn and use the moss at your own lawn. Or this is um, harvested, um, officially, legally harvested and uh, bagged up for, for sale in garden centres and whatnot. So you're just taking a, a, a stretch of it, taking it and stretching it out and then patching it back in to cover over the holes. This bit over here is a wee bit fragile. So I'm going to take some more and just pack it in using my fingers. This feels a bit fragile, so I'm just going to pack a little bit more around here. And I'll be fragile a bit there. Here we go. Get that out the way. So I've now got my my shell. I'm going to use my compost. So to leave it out there like so. I mentioned using doing this as a group activity. Somebody could be mixing the compost and perlite together while somebody was um deconstructing the basket, rebuilding the basket. And then I'm going to put a layer of compost in here. And this is my bed for my bulbs. The bulbs need to go in first of all, because they need to be planted below the, the a depth of soil compost, and then they will work their way up, growing up through the plants, any plants that might be planted in compost. This first bulb I'm going to plant is the, the dwarf daffodil, the Rip Van Winkle. Generally speaking, bulbs are planted to a depth three times their height. So in this case, this bulb is one, two, three. I want it actually sitting or almost inside this level that I've already planted and uh, put in here of compost. So I'm going to cover this whole layer 
I've got 15 bulbs in here because I really want this to be really bright and showy and very floriferous next springtime. Next March, these wee flowers should, bulbs should be flowering for me. So I'll just spreading them round about. Maybe I'm being a wee bit sort of like overzealous of them. How many is that? I must have about 12 to put in there. So I put in 12 there. And I'm just going to cover them a little bit because the next bulbs I'm going to put in are the, the crocus. They're even smaller again, you know, in relation, that's my pinky, so you can see how small they actually are. Same rule applies. They're going to get planted three times their depth. So just quite literally going to plonk them on top, the small, the slight covering of compost on top of the daffodil bulbs. Now I'm going to do these in little clusters. I'm going to do three clusters of five crocus, kind of at the, the side, so that they're going to kick up next February, March time the crocus should appear. Same thing, we've got a slightly hairier bottom and the bottom is the side that goes down and then this slight point, this is a wee shoot starting to develop already, that is facing upwards. But having said that, don't worry if your clients don't manage to get them the right way around. Bulbs are incredibly clever wee things. If I were to plant that one on its side, or indeed if I planted it upside down, the wee shoot knows where up is. So it'll grow along, then up to come out the compost the right way, or you know, whatever way it has to go, it'll do it to find its way up. What you might find is it doesn't put on such a good flower for you because it's used up so much energy trying to go the long way to get through the compost. But don't worry if they don't go in the right way. Aim to get them in the right way. And for all I know, I'm putting a bulb on top of a bulb. But again, I'm not worried about that because as I say, these three things know where they're going. And if they do come across something, an obstacle directly above where they're growing, they'll just grow to the side and round about it and, and go up that way. And another little light covering. Oops, gosh, not paying attention. Oh, you maybe didn't even see that. Out of camera shot, gosh. There we go. Now I'm going to do three little clumps of the muscari. And they're even smaller again. One, two, three, four. And this is all anticipation. This is all hope for next year. This is looking forward to what will be in a few months time. And it's an interesting activity if you were wanting to engage it, engage with folks in a vocational setting, perhaps. You could like, you know, like monitor their plant growth. When do we plant them? When do we see the first sprouts coming through? Which one is it? Is it the crocus that we expect to come up first of all, and then eventually it'll flower and you'll be able to identify it? So, you know, in a vocational setting, you can incorporate it into the curriculum. Science and art spring to mind, first of all, for me. But I'm no teacher, um, that would be. So, there we go. We have now got our bulbs and we've got our spring flowering surprises all in there. And now what I want to do is plant up some things to go at the top here that I can take out this afternoon and hang up and straight away I'm going to have something really quite um colourful and interesting to look at. I have pulled together uh, a kind of selection of, I'm just going to, oh, oh, sorry, there was, oh my goodness. You okay? Something was on the screen. Yeah, something was on the screen. Can you see my thingy okay, Jen? Yes, it's fine. It's clear. Okay. Um, okay, so I pulled together a little selection of plants. But if I were doing this with a, a group of people, I would 
discuss the plants beforehand. I would handle the plants, I would pass them round about, I would talk about their benefits, the colours, what's your favourite colour? Um, I have to say I quite like a blue. A little blue and white viola is probably one of my favourite bedding plants for the winter time. But equally, 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 we have nice bright lime green, tiny little conifers. Now this will eventually go big and tall and it'll have to go get planted in the garden somewhere. But we'll maybe get two years out of it in a basket or a container. And again, another lovely wee variegated shrub, evergreen. It will look like this all year round, but it's a nice contrast to some of the other plants that are maybe going in the basket. This is a Christmas rose. Got lots of little buds coming on it. Um, fancy name is Hellebore. There's lots of these available in the garden centres at the moment. And these are equally um, interesting to be planting up because any pollinating insects that are going about in the winter time because, you know, even your honeybees have to get out and about. They too have to go to the loo at some point during the winter time. So when they're nipping out to the loo, they might like a little um, jaunt along the garden to have a wee top up of um, getting some nectar. And a plant like your Christmas rose would supply that for them. Along with other plants, like sort of this, um, your winter flowering heathers will do it also. Um, and what other ones have we got here? The Mahonia. Look, there's so many plants here that we'll be getting. Um, I don't know if you can see that. All yeah. these, um, this jaggy plant, the leaves, very jaggy, but um, interesting sensory um, moment, perhaps. Um, but it makes these beautiful, can you see that okay, Jenny? This yeah. one, these lovely, bright yellow spikes of flower are fabulous. Um, and um, insects during the winter time will um, benefit from that plant being in the garden. Choosing plants, you could go with something like sort of this um, evergreen choice here. Bright foliage again, um, keeps it all year round, and it's got a kind of lemony scent. So it would be nice to handle it and talk about it before we actually planted it up. And if you live where I live, where there are deer on the go, it apparently is deer resistant also. So that's interesting. I will report back on that also. Now, I've only chosen those three types of bulbs, but, you know, the sky's the limit. Go into the garden centres and you will see there is almost far too much choice. You, you get a wee bit con confused. So this is a, a bright orange tulip. And then this is an allium, um, like the sort of drumstick um, onion plant. It's lovely, white with little like purple flecks through it. So really, it's very much a personal choice, but take the time to discuss what you want to plant and who's going to be handling them and, and the benefits of having them in the garden, thinking about your wildlife also. So I'm going to take my um, Christmas tree, Christmas trees, how they're Christmas tree, but my children used to call these Christmas trees when they were wee. And I'm just going to squeeze the pot and I'll just pop out quite a thing. I'll just take off this kind of, weedy moss stuff growing at the top and this is going to be my thriller of the, the the basket just make a little hole wiggle it in take some more compost and firm it round about like so and then i'm going to take a little selection this is a a winter flowering heather it's got the bright pink flowers on it. Again, beneficial to our insects in the winter time. Same thing, I'm just going to wiggle the hole and squidge it in there. This is a little Yonimus, nice and variegated. Lovely roots on it. If the roots are starting to spiral round, Try and tease them out because once roots start to spiral, they continue to spiral and you don't want them to do that. You want them to spread out wideways. This one's fine, it's not spiralling, but just be aware of that. And then I'm going to take my Christmas rose. And 
registered gear. Digging holes might be quite difficult for some, so perhaps you could dig the hole, or as an alternative, when you're filling up the basket, leave the plant in its pot, place it in the empty basket, then fill the compost round about it, lift the pot and plant completely out, which will leave a little planting hole, pull the plant out the pot, and then slot the plant back into the space that's been left, can help um, folks get planting independently. Now this is starting to take shape a little bit, lots of colour. I'm just checking the time Jenny and I'm aware we're kind of like whizzing through. So I just want to, I'm not going to plant up the whole thing. Violas um, are great for that instant zap of um, colour. Um, this is a little pansy actually, not a viola. Um, deadhead them as soon as the flower starts to go over a little bit and it will encourage flowering and that's good for creating a job to do somebody's got to go out and check the basket to make sure or indeed bring the basket into them to check if it needs deadheading. Squidge like so and I would continue all the way around with that and that would be a very bright and cheery hanging basket to put outside. Sorry, I'm not going to finish it just to save a little bit of time, Jenny, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, we spoke about the other plants, some of the Mahonia that I spoke about, this big plant here. You can buy little versions of them, but this would make a great focal point, a, a thriller for a bigger pot. And as I said, it's great for your wildlife. And you do, you get these lovely big strands of bright yellow flowers that will, these will start flowering about beginning of December and it'll stay flowering till February time, by which time your other bulbs will be coming up and you'll have that, um, gosh, four or five months of interest throughout the winter time. And yellow is just such a cheery colour. We, we can't do without yellow in our gardens. Okay, um, the bulbs themselves are an interesting subject that we could talk about for absolutely hours, talking about how we plant them in the autumn time and it's the cool, wet autumn conditions that, that develops the bulbs roots. And then the winter time, that cold snap, some bulbs actually need 10 weeks of 10 degrees or cooler temperature for them to actually make their stems. So if you ever see daffodils grow at the bit, tiny little stems and put the flower on, you know we've had a mild winter. Um, and then the springtime, that's when we get flowers. And then the summertime, the bulb stem and flower has all died back down, died back down into that little bulb. It snoozes all summer and it's effectively baking baby bulbs called bulblets. And then Next spring, sorry, next autumn, it goes through the process again. Temperature becomes cooler, it gets wetter, the wee bulb wakes up, develops its roots and repeats the cycle all over again. So bulbs are a really interesting subject to, um, to speak about with younger people, for older people. You could bring bulbs into reminiscence work, um, talking about your favourite spring bulb. Mine is a snowdrop. I just love it. It's the first uh, bulb to come up and I just think it's the cheeriest wee thing out there. Um, and I think I've probably talked enough, Jenny. Okay, how does that? Are you all right with that? That's grand, thanks. <laughs> anyway, so back to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Joan. Uh, lots of uh, autumn colour there and the promise of spring colour to come, which is always a lovely thing. So um, there was a question there in the chat that I noticed and somebody was concerned that all these bulbs are way down at the bottom of that basket. How can they possibly grow up to the top? Well, well that is the, the, <laughs> the magic of nature. I mean, I can't tell you how it works because I really do not know. Um, it amazes me myself. Um, and I have, um, oh, gosh, just it works it just they those little bulbs know where they need to go it's it's just how nature works they're programmed to do that and they just survive I have got an area of ground here that I built up over the years and I kind of it's I don't want to say I dump it because that sounds like I'm fly tipping but it's my own property so I can do what I want on it but it's like um 
old branches and it's like an area that I've built up the level and obviously over the years there's been bulbs have accidentally got put in with a uh, big chunks of um, wasted compost and things like that mm. and every spring I am amazed at the bulbs that grew up in this area because I didn't plant those bulbs there but I know they've accidentally worked their way in there now they didn't get planted at their proper height and they didn't get planted facing up the way they probably just got flung in there <laughs> and they are incredible how they just they just do it brilliant and um, katie's got a question and she's asking do you need to feed and water them over the winter okay um no to feed because all plants are effectively like all the shrubs that are planted in the violas as much as they're doing something that they're there there's color their roots aren't actively growing. They're sort of like just sitting there minding their own business and they don't need any more food than what will be available to them in the compost, the fresh compost that I've put in. They will need feeding come the springtime. That plant, the basket that I've just planted up could look so lovely next summer as well because it's got that evergreen foliage in it. But I would feed it come the springtime to give the plants the oomph that they need then. The bulbs don't need fed just now because they've got all their energy stored inside their little bulb coating. Mm -hmm. You would feed when the plant, when the basket is being fed next springtime, that's when the bulbs will take in food, yeah. suck it all down into their stems, store it inside the little um, cocoon of baldness. And when they're having their snooze next summer, They'll just sit in all that food and then when autumn comes and they spark back into life again, they'll start to eat up that reserve of food that they've slept with all summer. Great, thank you. And um, is it good to, a good idea to cover your basket with fleece? Do you need to kind of look after it in that way? All the plants that I've chosen this afternoon are all hardy for Scotland. They will survive beautifully. It would need to be some terrible, terrible winter that we wouldn't be worrying about our baskets <laughs> that, um, that would have to affect us for the plants to be damaged. So no, no. They would, they're, they're fine. That's great. Okay. And um, I had a question because I was interested to know what size of basket you were planting up because you said you had 15 bulbs and I wondered <laughs> what size your basket was to accommodate that. That's a 12 inch basket. 12 so inch. the size of a ruler, yep. 30 centimetres. Okay. That was the diameter across... Um, the, the the original basket. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, that's great. That gives us an idea of how many. Um, there's lots of uh, great comments here. Uh, what a great idea to put the bulbs underneath the autumn plants. Um, thanks, from Katie. And uh, uh, someone is asking. Uh, Ro Rosalia is asking when you see the bulbs coming through. When you see the the um, tips of the bulbs coming through their um, stalks, do you take the autumn plants out? I wouldn't know. I, I think it's personally, I like to see the wee flowers and they're starting to peek through and the foliage that's there um, sort of like emphasises them somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say no. I would be concerned that when you pull the autumn, like the shrubby plants out, you might disturb the actual bulbs themselves and the stems because the stems, the bulb, will have kind of grown its way up through the, the root system of the bulb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would I would leave everything in situ. Yeah, great.